Please be seated. The court is now back in session. Once again, the floor is given to Judge Cartwright to continue putting questions to this expert. You may proceed. Thank you, President. Uh, while the uh, Central Committee was established by statute, the Standing Committee was in fact not. Is that your understanding of the uh, situation? The Standing Committee, I'm sure, had a statutory existence. Uh, whether it is referred to in the statutes you just quoted, the 1975 statutes, uh, I'm not sure. But the Standing Committee certainly existed from uh, a very early stage of the CPK. Uh, after the 1963 Congress, after the 1960 Congress, since that time there has always been a central body, a very small central body, which determined policy. Uh, and um, after uh, April 1975 and the establishment of the, the uh, new uh, version of the Standing Committee, uh, who was the... Um, chair or president of it? The secretary of the standing committee has been, had been Pol Pot, uh, Salaf Sa, uh, since 1963. Uh, he later became secretary of the party. There is a distinction between being head of the standing committee and head of the whole party. Uh, Nguyen Chia uh, was, again from 1963, the number two, the Deputy Secretary. And both were members of the Standing Committee. I'm talking post-1975. Both before and after 1975, they held the same positions. They were members of the Standing Committee. Uh, in a paper that has been put before the um, chamber by Craig Etchison, uh, titled Overview of Hierarchy of Democratic Kampuchea, E3-494, the author states that the Standing Committee was known also as the center or the organization and that it operated from an office called Office 870. Do you agree with that? I agree with it partly. Uh, the organization, uh, literally Anka, was the term used for uh, the Khmer Communist Party as a whole by its members especially in the early period when it was in clandestinity, and it then became uh, the name by which the population knew the Cambodian Communist Party. Um, 870, yes, was the code name for the Standing Committee. In his uh, statement to the co-investigating judges, Kyo Sampon says... In principle, the Central Committee was the most important body, but in practice, it was the Standing Committee. We can compare this to the Parliament and the government in a parliamentary regime. It is the government that conducts the day-to-day -day business of the state. Therefore, the Central Committee did not have effective power as opposed to the Standing Committee. Do you agree with that statement of Kyo Sampan? Yes. With the one proviso that a, in a parliamentary system of parliament controls, exercises control over government, in the Khmer Rouge regime, the Central Committee did not exercise control over the Standing Committee. 
Are you familiar with the role and functions of uh, the Standing Committee? And I'll just ask you some questions uh, and you can agree or not. First, did the Standing Committee have the power to appoint senior officials to the party, the government, and the military? Uh, and did it have the power of monitoring and implementation of CPK policies? It had those powers, certainly, whether it exercised them in a systematic way, and I'm thinking of monitoring and uh, verifying, uh, that is a different matter. In the minutes of 9 October, the Standing Committee minutes of 9 October 1975, E3-182, uh, uh, a meeting that both Kyo Sompon and Nguyen Chia are recorded as attending, it was resolved that in bringing up projects, we must ask the Standing Committee's opinion so it may decide and approve them. Uh, the minutes also record that while all the work should not be concentrated at the Standing Committee, it will monitor each section's implementation of the line and receive reports from all those responsible for the various aspects of government uh, and the military. Uh, does that um, reflect reasonably well, subject to the caveat you just gave, the uh, functions of the Standing Committee and its particular role in relation to those uh, bodies and uh, parts of the country, such as the zones and the districts under it? Yes. The um, Standing Committee also required in these minutes uh, that each person who'd been given responsibility for an area of work and operations, uh, for example, Nguyen Chia, uh, Party Affairs and uh, State, and Kyo Sampon, the Front, the Royal Government and Commerce, must report to the Standing Committee. Does that reflect your uh, knowledge of the relationship between the members of the Standing Committee with each other? That is quite a difficult question. I'm, I'm not trying to avoid a clear answer. Um, I don't think anyone, except those who are actually members of the Standing Committee, is in a position to say quite how they interacted. Uh, I can't see uh, Nguyen Chia uh, reporting to his colleagues on his own work. He was at a, if you like, a higher level as Deputy Secretary. Um, basically, he and Pol Pot divided responsibility for all aspects of work between the two of them. That other members would, would report, uh, essentially, when there was a standing committee meeting, uh, uh, Q Sompon or the, 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 the other members would report at the standing committee, but to Pol Pot and, to some extent, Nguyen Chia. So it wasn't um, among equals. There was a definite hierarchical structure. Returning briefly to the statute, um, the Revolutionary Army was uh, specifically uh, referred to in the statute uh, and uh, was stated to be under the absolute leadership mono monopoly of the CPK. Uh, did it also uh, report to the Standing Committee? Yes, commanders uh, in the, the zone leaders and uh, zone military commanders would send telegrams to 870. That would be the destination. Uh, the um, other branch of a government, uh, as uh, the 
Western Democratic un understands it to be, is the judiciary. Uh, there was no mention of a judiciary in the statute that we've been discussing, but in a press release uh, issued by the People's Representative Assembly on the 14th of April, 1975, E3-262 on the final page, this was the complete mention of the judiciary. After in-depth discussion, the Assembly appointed a Judiciary Committee whose president is Kang Chap, and that's the end of the statement. Did you ever discuss the establishment of this committee, or indeed an independent judicial system or a judicial system of any description with uh, any of your interviewees? To the best of my recollection, no, for one reason. There was no judiciary or judicial system in Cambodia, in Khmer Rouge, Cambodia. Therefore, there seemed no point in raising it. It never existed. Now, the various organs that I have mentioned, very briefly, the um, General Conference or People's Congress, uh, the Central Committee, the Army, the Judiciary, um, where was the real uh, organization of the work of the democratic Kampuchean regime conducted within any of those organs, excepting the judiciary, which you've already uh, mentioned? The, the army was controlled by the defense ministry, that is by the defense minister, Son Sen. Uh, who was, in fact, not a full member, but an, uh, an alternate member of the Standing Committee. Um, the, the, there is a real problem uh, as to whether there was any independent decision-making power within government, within what we would describe as a Council of Ministers. A Council of Ministers was said to have existed. People were designated as this minister or that minister, but my understanding, and it can only be an understanding, is that all the decision-making power resided in the party structure, in other words, the standing committee, and that government, uh, although ministries existed, some more than others, uh, basically was a transmission belt with no authority. Now I want to return to Kyo Sampon and then Nguyen Chia and look at their roles in relation to these bodies and structures. Um, in, by uh, 1975, uh, or rather 1976, uh, he had already been appointed to some roles, formal roles in the democratic Kampuchean regime. Um, for example, in the um, minutes of the 30th of March 1976, uh, that is of the Standing Committee, E3-12, stroke which is titled Decision of the Central Committee Regarding a Number of Matters, he was noted as, appointed, uh, as being President of the State Presidium of Democratic Kampuchea. Uh, in effect, was that now the formal acknowledgement of his title as um, head of state? Yes, it was. <laughs> he was uh, a candidate member of the Central Committee, as you have indicated, but became a full member of the Central Committee from 1976. Um, uh, does that, uh, is that a fair summary of your knowledge of his role in the Central Committee? Yes, his, uh, as I understood it, his promotion to full membership was in parallel to the decision to appoint him head of state. Uh, 
Now, he has said uh, consistently that he was not appointed to the Standing Committee, um, but none of the minutes of the Standing Committee that record his attention, uh, attendance make any distinction uh, in this regard. Are you able to shed any light on his formal position within the Standing Committee? I'm not, uh, except to say that I have never seen any document, nor have I interviewed anyone, who affirmed or which stated that Kusompon was a member of the Standing Committee. His presence is absolutely certain. Um, and in a way, uh, follows naturally enough from the role he had earlier, which was to accompany the top leadership to become, to be a sort of amanuensis and um, uh, therefore to attend Standing Committee meetings after 1975. But I could not say that he had the, the decision-making role that a full member of the standing committee would have had. I don't think he was a full member. And the reason, he was, after all, an intellectual. He, his path into the party was not the path taken by the former Israq warlords, who became the zone commanders, and it was not the path taken by Pol Pot and Ying Siri uh, and Nguyen Chia, the, the, the the guiding core of the Standing Committee, so that he had this, I won't say peripheral role, but a, a different kind of role uh, is understandable. Uh, I want to look at what he says of his uh, roles during the period we're concerned with, uh, and um, going back to his um, monograph, uh, E318, uh, E3 stroke 18, he says um, uh, English 00103749, Khmer 00103837, and French 00595425. That uh, neither he, Hunim, or Hu Yuan led any forces. He says, and I quote, We were only the figureheads of the Khmer Rouge movement and had no role in the movement's leadership or in key decisions. When you um, discussed, um, uh, when you interviewed him, did you, did you talk to him about? what he perceived his role as and what uh, the membership or at least the attendance at the standing committee and membership of the central committee uh, might indicate to the contrary. I have no recollection of, of having discussed with him specifically the question of attendan attendance at standing committee meetings. I mean, certainly he said he was not a member. Uh, he used, to me, terms very similar to those you have just mentioned, that they were indeed, the three of them, Hu Nim, Hu Yun, and Q Sompon, figureheads. Uh, I think it's absolutely true that none of them had any military command responsibilities. Their, their role in decision-making, uh, likewise. Uh, there is a question a little bit later on, which perhaps you will come to, as to what his role in the, in the general office of the Standing Committee was. But again, we're not talking about a decision-making role. We would be talking about an executive role Well, uh, I presume you're referring to his position within the organization Office 870, um, and, and he says in that same monograph, I was responsible for relations with the prince and his wife and for establishing a price scale for products from the cooperatives and other economic units. He was also responsible for 
implementing the permanent committee's decisions, and from that I infer standing committee, regarding the distribution of products collected in Phnom Penh to different zones and regions, and working with the Department of Foreign Trade to ensure the importation of specific goods. This tends to suggest that he had a very narrow area of responsibility and that membership of the Central Committee and at least attendance at uh, many of the uh, Standing Committee meetings was uh, of no significance in regard to his particular role. Do you agree or not? I don't agree with the words of no significance. Uh, the very fact of attending standing committee meetings uh, is itself significant. This was a very small group of people, and if you were there during their discussions, that gave you a certain power. Uh, not necessarily the power to influence those decisions, but at least you were among a very, very small group which knew what was going on. Um, and I didn't, when I referred to the general office, I did not mean 870, which is the same as the standing committee. Uh, there was a general office headed initially by Dern, and in which Kyu Sompon later played a role, which was, if you like, the executive arm of 870. And there, I think he, well, as I say, he had an executive role, but to what extent it may or may not have been decision-making, mm. it's very, very difficult to say. Uh, I want to take you to uh, a selection of the surviving minutes of the uh, Standing Committee uh, and just uh, very briefly summarize the topics that were discussed at each of these meetings uh, and each um, record that both Kyu Sompon and Nguyen Chia attended. Uh, I'm going to deal first with the minutes of the 8th of March 1976, E3-231, uh, concerning propaganda. So that was the topic discussed at that meeting. Uh, a further meeting on the same day, E3-232, uh, on base work, and uh, during that meeting, Kyo Sompon reported on issues around the election and methods of propaganda and education. 11th of March, 1976, E3-197, again attended by both Nguyen Chia and Kyo Sompon, when uh, Prince Sihanouk's resignation was discussed and Kyo Sampan reported on the Prince's views. At that time, there was a direction by the Comrade Secretary, or Pol Pot, that Prince Sihanouk was not to leave the country. Uh, uh, he was to be kept as a dignitary, but that he should not uh, be killed. Um, a further meeting on the same day, 11th of March, E3-217, where there was a discussion of the resolution of border conflicts and of the approach if Vietnam committed aggression against democratic Kampuchea on the eastern border, uh, discussing both defense and attack on Vietnam as political measures uh, and also discussing ongoing negotiations over the border. 13th of March, 3 stroke 234, again both were present, uh, and that was uh, a discussion of commerce and contacts with China uh, and the forming of a delegation seeking to make purchases from uh, China. Now, all of those meetings indicate that a very wide range of uh, military, economic, diplomatic, uh, political matters were discussed. Uh, and that uh, both, as both Nguyen Chia and Kyo Sampon were present, uh, do you have anything to say about the level of knowledge and engagement that both might have had, uh, or particularly knowledge that both might have had about the ongoing 
conduct of the affairs of democratic Kampuchea. I would repeat what I said a little earlier, that is that the very fact of being at the Standing Committee gave knowledge which, which was extraordinary because so few people have it. What we don't know is what, uh, what input Q Songpong had at those meetings on these individual issues. The, uh, the minutes of the meeting on base work on the 8th of March 1976, it says uh, that Comrade Hem, Q Songpong, reported on, as you said, education and propaganda and indeed methods of election. Uh, I think that was certainly one of his fields, uh, education and propaganda generally, not just in relation to the, uh, the elections. And there are quite well attested um, uh, uh, evidence or witnesses who, who have described being at seminars long seminars at the Olympic Stadium and elsewhere uh, in which Q Sompan um, gave them ideological training guidance. So that, I think, was one of his fields. The military questions, um, the, the whole problem of border uh, incursions with Vietnam, I, I, again, I have absolutely no evidence that he had an important role in that. He was there, he listened, he had knowledge, but I doubt very much that he had a great deal to say. And it, it might just be worth mentioning that insofar as I've had any evidence of how the Standing Committee worked, Pol Pot would chair the meetings, he would ask people's opinions on key issues, and then at the end he would set out the policy which he had from the start wanted to follow, incorporating some of the remarks that had been made around the table. That was his modus operandi. And uh, I think the key thing is that he would incorporate others' remarks, but the policy which emerged was that which he had essentially decided himself before the meeting even began. There was another meeting, but this time of the Central Committee on the 30th of March, 1976. Uh, no uh, record, we have no record of who attended that meeting. Uh, it has the document number E3-12. At that time, however, Kyo Son Pon was either a candidate member of the Central Committee or a full rights member, according to your um, uh, testimony. And, of course, Nguyen Chia was a full member of the Central Committee. Now, this was the occasion when um, the now familiar uh, right uh, to smash inside and outside the ranks was formulated. Uh, among the bodies entitled to smash were the Zone Standing Committees, and the Central Office Committee, um, uh, of which both he and both Kyo Sampon and Nguyen Chia were members, uh, the Standing Committee and General Staff. Now, do you think it's possible that um, either man was unfamiliar with those uh, decisions made, uh, recorded at that meeting on that occasion? I'm sure they were both familiar with that, that, that decision. Um, I, I'm not at all sure, in fact I doubt, that although it says decision of the Central Committee, I don't think there was a Central Committee meeting which took that decision. That terminology could equally apply to uh, a decision issued by the Standing Committee. Um, but I'm quite sure that both Mr. Q Sampan and certainly Mr. Nguyen Chia uh, were very well aware of what was in this document. Kyo Sompon and Nguyen Chia's uh, relationship uh, uh, outside of these uh, meetings, are you able to comment at all on that? Did they, um, uh, are, you are you aware of whether they respected each other, worked together, 
Do you have any comments? I think all I can say is there is evidence that uh, uh, Pol Pot thought highly of Q Sompon. And I can't remember the exact document or speech, but he was one of those, I think perhaps Nguyen Chia was the other, who, whom he singled out, and it was something he very rarely did. Um, the relationship between Q Sompon and Nguyen Chia, I have no privileged information on at all. According to Etchison, um, there were offices that operated under Office 870, all with the, um, the prefix K, uh, and Pol Pot was said to live and work at K1, uh, and Nguyen Chia and Kyo Sampan both lived at K3. Does that accord with your knowledge? Not entirely, no. Um, Pol Pot had three main residences, at least that I know of, in, in uh, Phnom Penh. And the one in which they lived, and Q Sampan was there, Vaughan Vet was there, Nguyen Chia was there, was the, in the so-called bank buildings at the forearms of, uh, of, of the, the river. Um, that, that became the main permanent headquarters. <laughs> there was another one, which is that whole block where Lucky Supermarket now is. That was another, another residence, and there was a third residence further out. But are you saying that uh, all these, all these well-known names from Pol Pot through Vaughan Vet, Kyo Sampan, and Nguyen Chia uh, all operated working and living together very much in, in company with each other? Yes. Now, I want to turn to Nguyen Chia, uh, who, he, who has himself confirmed his lengthy involvement with the Communist Party of, its, of Kampuchea and its predecessors, uh, and also that since 1960 he was appointed Deputy Secretary of the party, uh, a position that continued through the DK era. Uh, that uh, complies with your knowledge, does it? Absolutely. His responsibilities as Deputy Secretary, you've already touched on those uh, to some degree. Um, he was, uh, if I may summarize, very much uh, alongside Pol Pot or immediately beneath him. Is that a fair summary or is it uh, overstating the position? I think it's a fair summary. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to grasp that exact relationship between Pol Pot and Nguyen Chia. Um, I, I remember suggesting to some former Khmer Rouge officials that Nguyen Chia was the manager and Pol Pot was the, if you like, the, you know, the, the director. And they said, no, it wasn't that clear cut. It was perhaps closer to an alter ego they occupied, they, they both took an interest in and uh, responsibility for the same things in many cases. So it was difficult, very difficult to know where um, the influence of one and the influence of the other started and ended. Uh, and um, we've, we know that he has deputized for Pol Pot on occasions, but it's a little unclear about whether, uh, due to Nguyen Chia's own statements on this topic, as to whether, in fact, he was acting prime minister uh, at some stage, as alleged in the closing order in paragraph 888. Do you have any knowledge about that? This is something I dealt with in my book. Um, uh, it, uh, no, I... I I don't think he was um, acting prime minister. I think this was 
something which uh, had been agreed between the two of them, basically to throw sand in the eyes of the Vietnamese who misinterpreted it as the eclipse of Pol Pot and Ying Suri and were very happy about that. And uh, in fact, no, the leadership remained united and Pol Pot, al although it was announced that he had stepped down as prime minister, uh, no such thing happened. Now, with his um, uh, roles as deputy secretary of the party, uh, membership of the central committee uh, and um, uh, also of the standing committee and deputizing roles in those committees, uh, does that structure uh, align with your um, knowledge of other communist parties, uh, for example, China and uh, Russia, that you have studied, this um, blending of different roles and, uh, and uh, no clear distinction between, shall we say, the legislative branch and the executive branch dismissing the judicial branch, of course. What, what, what do you um, have to say about that? Was it a common way to run a communist party then? Yes and no. Uh, no in the sense that the uh, democratic Kampuchea regime, the CPK, CPK, was really sui generis. It was of its own kind and unlike any others. That said, all communist parties, all communist systems uh, have ultimate decision-making by the party, by the Central Committee or the Politburo. But more usually, the way they do it is to have a, what is called a party fraction in the leadership of the ministry. And through uh, the, the party fraction, the Central Committee instructions are then conveyed to the elements of government. So there is a much more defined structure and system for the party to convey its, its, its orders. Uh, in democratic Kampuchea, that, it was not that systematized. And the blending of roles, particularly between Nguyen Chia and Pol Pot, I can think of no, no equivalent really in any other communist party. Do you think that this was the result of what you described earlier today as the stage that the Communist Party of Kampuchea was at, that is the infant stage, uh, the unevolved stage, or do you think it was deliberate, for example, to cast, keep a veil over their activities? Is there any, anything from your research that you can uh, assist me with there? I think the first reason that it was uh, a communist party at a very early stage of its development probably was a, a, a factor. I don't think it was deliberately, I don't think it was part of the secrecy element. Um, and I suspect if, if the communist party of Kampuchea had remained in power for longer, then it would gradually have become more structured. Uh, the, there are certain signs, sorry, signs that that was happening. Um, beyond that, the, sorry, you, there was a third question which I've now forgotten. No. Uh, Nunchia has always denied having any uh, formal role in relation to the military um, affairs of democratic Kampuchea. Uh, I, I just want to know what your view of that is. Uh, do you have any knowledge of his involvement, direct involvement in decisions relating to the military outside those standing committee minutes where military matters were discussed? No, I don't. Uh, he, did, he did have 
some military decision-making uh, role much, much later on in the middle 1990s when they were fighting a guerrilla war still and it was very, uh, there were very much localized commands in different, different parts of the guerrilla areas. But in the period 1975 to 1979, no, I don't think he had a military role. There is um, one um, uh, report of a standing committee meeting uh, convened on the 26th of March 1976, E3-218, which has the heading National Defence, uh, indicating the um, subject matter of the meeting, and I have raised this previously with another uh, uh, expert. Uh, in that um, uh, st that particular standing committee meeting was chaired by Nguyen Chia uh, as Deputy Secretary. There's no uh, confirmation that Pol Pot was there at all. And uh, there is a lengthy uh, report by Comrade Ya um, concerning military policy, um, uh, mi the military situation vis-à-vis -vis Vietnam, uh, and towards the end, the opinions and instructions from Comrade Deputy Secretary are uh, set out in, in reasonable detail. What, uh, how do you, um, how do you characterise that degree of involvement in discussion or direction with relation to military affairs? Well, Comrade Ya was Ne Saran, who was a zone leader, um, and therefore not directly a military leader. So it was within the party that this discussion took place, uh, not, not from Nguyen Chia directly to military commanders. And I, I, I missed the date, but if Pol Pot were not there, I would imagine it's because he was out of the country. I, that he did make a number of, of unpublicized visits to China. And uh, there was one in 76. If it was at that time, that would explain why Nguyen Chia would be chairing the meeting. This was the 26th of March, 1976. Let me just look, I forgive me, but we could probably sort this out. No, I have no record, record of a visit then, I'm afraid. Nguyen Chia himself, in his statement to the co-investigating judges, uh, on the 19th of September 2007, E3-54 described his role in um, uh, the uh, Democratic Kampuchea post-1975 like this. As for myself, after the liberation, I was in the legislative body, so I was not involved with the executive. Besides the party, there was a military committee of the party whose chairman was Pol Pot, with Son Sen and Ta Mok as deputies, and Sa Pim and Ke Pok as members. So I was not in the military committee. I was deputy secretary of the party and president of the assembly. Besides that, I was in charge of educating Kada and fam uh, party members. So I was not involved in anything relating to these charges. These are the charges that the co-investigating judge had just uh, announced to him. At that time, the military were the strongest group because they were the ones who defeated Lon Nol. As for the politicians, they were not strong they received less esteem. 
do you think that that is a fair uh, summary of his influence within the democratic Kampuchean regime, namely that his influence was less than those who had direct involvement with military um, uh, orders and organization? No, I think that is not true. It's, um, it's a mixture of, of elements which are undoubtedly true. Uh, he was not part of the military committee. And extrapolations, which I certainly would not agree with. Um, to, to pretend that the military had power in democratic Cambodia and that the politicians, in other words, the party leaders, did not, is to turn truth on its head. Uh, the, the party needed the support of the military, but as I think you read out in, in one of the documents we've just heard, the army was absolutely subordinated to the party. Uh, and it was the party which took the decisions which the military implemented. Um, it relied... There, there was a disconnect in the sense that the, the military leaders, the main military leaders like Tarmok and Kaipok, had come up from the Isarak tradition, whereas uh, the party leadership uh, was from Paris, the former students, and in the case of Nguyen Chia, from Thailand. So there were different groups which Pol Pot tried to bring together and reconcile. But the final word was with the party. Uh, this isn't a very critical point, but um, speaking before the trial chamber some months ago now, Nguyen Chia demurred when it, suggested, it was suggested to him that he was called brother number two during this regime. Um, is that a title that's been uh, developed since the regime was... Uh, pushed out of uh, Phnom Penh, or was it something that was current during the regime? Both Pol Pot and Nguyen Chia were called Om, Grand Uncle. Um, Pol Pot was also known as uh, First Brother, Bang Ti Moi, Bang Ti Moi, and uh, Nguyen Chia, yes, was, was second brother, and Ying Siri was third brother. But the, the use of brother number one, brother number two, uh, with respect to my colleagues who've used it, uh, I, I think is wrong. Um, it gives an Orwellian overtone, which did not exist at the time. And every family in Vietnam, in China, has a first, second, third, fourth, fifth brother. Uh, that's, that's the way your family members are known. So it was, it was in no sense menacing. It was just how they were described. I, I want to finish my questioning of you with a, a, a discussion of a topic that you touch on uh, from time to time through your book, uh, which does not focus specifically on Nguyen Chia or Kyo Son Pon, but on the regime itself. And that's the question of secrecy um, as used in the regime. Um, before April 1975, you speak at page 162 of the cha change of name from the Workers' Party to the Communist Party of Kampuchea in 1966. And you said it was kept secret from the party rank and file and from the Vietnamese. Uh, some of the comments you've made this morning and this afternoon about um, keeping matters confidential from the Vietnamese may apply here, but what about the party rank and file? Um, are you able to say your source for that uh, and also why the change of name would be kept secret? The change of name was kept secret essentially from the Vietnamese. 
and the party rank and file were not told because if the party rank and file had known, then it would have leaked out to Hanoi. And the reason was that the Vietnamese have a Vietnamese Workers' Party, and if the uh, Cambodians have a Cambodian Kampuchean Communist Party, in the hierarchy of, uh, of, of party values, if you like, that indicates a superior level of development. So they did not want needlessly to annoy the Vietnamese on, whose, uh, uh, on whom they still relied uh, for many things at that time. But secrecy, uh, yes, was an absolutely characterizing uh, aspect of the Cambodian communist leaders. Nguyen Chia, in the interview in 1978, which you read extracts from earlier, um, makes a, a, a very strong point to a Danish Communist Party delegation that secrecy is the key to everything. And it's partly explained... Uh, I mean, there are many aspects. I remember Mr. Q Song Kong, when we, when we talked saying uh, uh, you, you, can't, you can't tell Cambodians anything, they can't keep a secret for one minute. So there is an attitude, and Mr. Kusampan was not alone in that view, there is an attitude that unless things are kept secret, uh, they will leak immediately. In the 1960s, uh, Sihanouk's police force, Prince Sihanouk's police force was very strong, very numerous, very determined to uh, root out communist influence. Again, clandestinity was essential. And you go back still further, under the French, when the Isarak were active, the same, uh, not, not, uh, the, the, the same obsession with secrecy occurred. So uh, the regime throughout was characterized by secrecy. And I think it has as much to do with Khmer culture as with uh, objective practical conditions. Uh, in this period before 1975, you describe Nguyen Chia's work in Phnom Penh as his secret work. That's at page 183 of your book. And you describe him uh, uh, as he was in 1968 in these terms, Nguyen Chia, the opaque master of the underground, undetected by authorities, continued to devote himself to what was now his main task, using his cover as a commercial traveler to send rifles, grenades, and ammunition to the rebels in the bush. Uh, you also speak of how Nguyen Chia managed to remain in Phnom Penh for some time after other uh, notable figures had fled to the jungle, and that was in spite of um, crackdowns. Uh, he, he remained undetected. Is this, um, again, part of the secrecy that would surround a clandestine or illegal organization which is trying to take power or were there some other reasons other than those you've already touched on? I think, uh, I think, I think Nguyen Chia was simply very good at it. Um, he managed to remain undetected where others decided it had become too dangerous and they should go to the bush. Uh, to the, to the jungle. Um, no, it's part of the general, of the general clandest of, of modus operandi in clandestinity. But it also suggests that uh, Nguyen Chia was um, uh, not easily ruffled. He could live under st considerable stress, uh, perhaps more effectively than some of the others. Uh, in the same period, uh, 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 another reference to secrecy, you speak of the secret offices of the Communist Party of Kampuchea, um, and uh, you mention uh, another more secret office known as L-71, headed by Son Sen's wife, Yun Yat, produced the party's internal monthly journal, Revolutionary Flags, which appeared in two versions, one with five flags on the cover, 
destined for senior cadre and the other with a single flag for the party rank and file. So this again, I infer, is um, uh, part of the development of, a, of an illegal organization and the extension of its influence to the pa party rank and file as well as a method of communication with the more significant f figures pre-1975. Is that a fair inference? Yes, L71 was near Kampongtom in the early 70s. Uh, and again, you, you know, knowledge is power. So it's uh, quite parsimoniously distributed to those who need or can be trusted uh, with different degrees of, of knowledge. After liberation, as you've already indicated, this, um, this secrecy continued, and you referred to uh, E3 stroke 196, the statement of the Communist Party of Kampuchea to the Communist Workers' Party of Denmark in July of 1978, a speech given by Nguyen Chia as uh, Dep Deputy Secretary. Uh, and in that, uh, he speaks about secrecy after liberation. And he says, since liberation, we continue secret work because we consider the strategic line to be more important than tactics. We have published the names of only a few of our cadre and members. Not many need to be public. During the war, all of them were secret. Uh, and he goes on to say that uh, they learned to do this from the experiences of the Communist Party in Kampuchea and also gives examples of the way they operated signals and flags and pictures and so on. Um, so why, after liberation, was it so important to keep the names of the um, significant people in the party or indeed other members of the CPK so secret? Well, you are touching on a, a subject which, which is not limited to this. Um, and at, at, at the risk of using a shorthand term, uh, one would have to say paranoia. And there is a geographical paranoia of Cambodia squeezed between big Thailand and big Vietnam. Uh, there is a paranoia uh, about uh, enemies burrowing within the party. Um, that, I can only call it paranoia, took many different forms throughout the, uh, the Cambodian, the Kampuchean Communist Party regime. And I think this is simply one, one aspect of it, put in a particularly dramatic way by uh, Nguyen Chia to a fo friendly foreign Communist Party delegation. Well, Mr. Short uh, and President, that was the extent of the questioning that, uh, the examination that I wished to uh, make. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Short. I think you will find there are quite a few more questions because mine have been fairly narrow in scope. Thank you. The President, I hand over to Judge uh, Zongmark Lawange. You may proceed, Judge. Thank you, Mr. President, and good afternoon to you, Mr. Short. I have a certain number of questions to put to you to add to what we have already heard so far. And to begin with, I'd like to ask you about one of the sources you used in writing your book, Pol Pot, History of a Nightmare. In your book, you referred to a document which you said was written by Im Sopip, if you'll pardon the pronunciation. The document is called 
Cure Sans Pont enlarged and real, or something to that effect, says the interpreter. And it is a typewritten note. So it's not a published document, which may be problematic. This document may be one of those that is in the DC CAM holdings. I don't have a copy. And I'm wondering if you look at the document, you could authenticate it as being the one that you, in fact, used in writing your book as one of your sources. Yes. Um, sorry, I was fiddling with this. If, if I'm shown it, I probably can Id identify it. In that case, I'll ask the greffier to give you the document when we have the coffee break, and that way you'll have a look at it. If the witness identifies the document, of course, it will be made available to the parties. I have other questions to ask you about sources, but before doing that, I'd like to ask you about any possible link between population movements and the establishment of a policy of forced collectivization by the ever-increasing development of cooperatives. Could you tell us first if, before the evacuation of Phnom Penh, the Khmer Rouge leadership prepared a population movement policy. Obviously, there were actual practices, but in what sort of context did those practices develop? Uh, it did start earlier. It started uh, with uh, the... Ah, she can't, the translator can't hear. Si je parle en français, est-ce que ça va mieux? Non? No, je, je me permets de vous interrompre. Judge Laverne, no, it is actually better if you stay in the same language or else it can cause difficulties in the interpretation system. But the start of what you were saying was not heard in the French bridge, so if you could repeat that, it would be very useful. I apologize, uh, I, I understand. Um, no, I was saying that, uh, yes, there were movements of population uh, earlier. I think the, the, the first ones uh, started, the first ones we really know of, started in 1973. Then uh, there was the movement of population out of Kratie and from Udon uh, in 1974. Uh, there were movements of population uh, along the Vietnamese border, regrouping into, uh, in, into collectives. So it didn't start in 1975. Uh, it, it did start earlier, but it was usually on a small scale and in, in many cases for practical reasons in the countryside, uh, whereas in 1975 it became an ideological movement. What I would like to do is read out a part of your book to see if you still agree with what you wrote at the time. In French, the ERN is 0063 97, 73 to 74. In English, 0039, 
This is an excerpt which says that in order to avoid bombardments, entire villages were moved, evacuated, and transferred elsewhere. Population movements on a smaller scale had already occurred in 1970, and even in Ratnakiri from 1968. But in that instance, it was designed to allow people to escape government controls by transferring them further within liberated zones. Now, you did refer to the year 1973, but going on with the excerpt, now they were sent to remote mountain and jungle areas. Their original homes, if not already destroyed, were burned down to stop them returning. Instead of working individually or in small mutual aid teams, they were dragooned into cooperatives of 30 or 40 families who farmed the land in common. Here too there were precedents in the southwest and the special zone. Attempts have been made to introduce cooperatives after the May 1972 Central Committee meeting. But they had been unpopular and authorities had not insisted. Now collectivization was imposed by force throughout the liberated zones. Quote unquote. This is a first extract I wanted to read to you. Do you still agree with what you wrote in your book? And if so, could you comment on why? Thank you. Yes, I certainly agree with what I wrote. Um, but I think you, there is a distinction uh, between collectivization and population movements. Um, collectivization could occur without a village being moved. Uh, when villages were burnt down and the population moved elsewhere, it was usually for practical reasons. Practical reasons in the CPK context at that time uh, being, as, sorry, as the extract says, um, for control. We later, uh, with the evacuation of Batambong and Phnom Penh after April 1975, it's really a different exercise. It's not about regrouping villages to collectivize them, whether on the spot or elsewhere. It's about emptying the towns. When a population is moved before or after 75, is the point as well not to facilitate the establishment of cooperatives? You say that you don't need to move a village to turn it into a cooperative, but when people are displaced, Are there any other options other than turning them into cooperatives? But it wasn't always necessary to displace people in order to create cooperatives. My understanding is that many, indeed the majority of cooperatives, were based on the villages which were already existing. There were areas particularly along the Vietnamese border where villages were destroyed and people were moved up into more remote areas. 
But there were many areas, the majority, where the cooperatives were created on the basis of existing villages. You mentioned the Ratanakiri um, uh, movements of population. Again, they, they, they were for very practical reasons uh, to uh, take uh, supporters of the, what was then a, a nascent guerrilla campaign against the government into safer areas which could be more easily defended. So, again, practical reasons. I, I think these were two different things, collectivization and population movements. I think we can come back to this issue at a later stage. This may be a good moment to have a break, Mr. President. The time is now appropriate for a short break. We short a break until 3 p.m. when we return. Court officer, could you assist the expert during the break and have him return to the courtroom at 3 p.m.? The court is now adjourned. Sub-groucher.